This is Smart Poker Study episode 187, getting more bread and butter in your poker play sessions. In last week's strategy episode number 186, I played for you a chapter from my upcoming book, Preflop Online Poker. The chapter was called Stealing Fundamentals. It's poker study time, y'all. Good morning, and thank you so much for telling your friends. You know, I say it every time. Thank you so much for telling those that you know about the show. But it's really how the show grows. It's word of mouth, and it's the most important thing. Uh, So, you know, I really am appreciative of all of you sharing the word. And uh, speaking of appreciation, I have so much appreciation for my newest Patreon supporter. His name is Charles Ogle. You know, I love creating this weekly show for you. And I've been in touch with Charles Ogle for a long time via email and stuff. He was a uh, Patreon supporter a while ago. Um, He stopped and then resumed his Patreon support. So I thank you so much, Charles, for, uh, for getting back into the swing of things on Patreon over there. Your support shows me that you enjoy the show. So to start your own support of the show, go to patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash smartpokerstudy. There are different levels of support with different rewards attached. And uh, later this week, or possibly early next week, I'm going to be coming out with the May's, uh, May support reward. So get in on that uh, before those episodes drop pretty darn soon. Once you begin your support on Patreon, you'll get the current month's reward as well as access to the archive of patron-only content. So please visit www.patreon.com slash study to start your support. Okay, in today's episode, I'm going to get back to the bread and butter, which we discussed um, uh, in the previous leak plugging episode number 184, and I'm going to tell you how you can put yourself in more bread and butter situations, and how you can also avoid those non-bread and butter spots. Please visit the show notes page for everything I discussed today, along with screenshots and links at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod187. Okay? Let's get to the bread and butter. Gambate. This is damn exciting stuff. So there are two aspects to putting yourself in more bread and butter situations. Doing so, and then also avoiding those non-bread and butter spots. You might not realize it, but every tough spot and every favorable spot that you find yourself in, it's due to your own choices. Maybe you got to the flop with pocket jacks as the pre-flop caller in the big blind. Well, that's your own doing. If you got to the flop in position with ace-king versus five other players, that's your own doing. You did something to allow that to happen. Maybe you got to the flop with pocket deuces, and the flop comes ace-king-deuce, and maybe you were the three better pre-flop. Once again, that was your own doing. Every hand that you involve yourself in, you purposefully choose to do it. You control your actions in every single hand that you play. And because of this, you can purposefully put yourself in more bread-and-butter situations and you can avoid those non-bread and butter situations as well. First, I'm going to talk to you about getting more bread and butter during your poker sessions. Now, there are three aspects uh, to putting yourself in more bread and butter situations. The first aspect is play with a bread and butter mindset. This is when you search for and put yourself in the most profitable of situations. Remember, bread and butter is you are in position on the flop as the pre-flop raiser, and against one or two other players. So with that bread and butter mindset, you're actively searching, you know, if you're an online player, uh, or I guess if you're live, no matter what situation you're in, you're looking for those spots when you can be in position on the flop, you made that last raise pre-flop so you can be the one C betting, either as bluffs or for value, and you're doing so against one or two other players. One or two is great when you're bluffing because it's easier to bluff only one or two other players. And one or two is great also uh, when it comes to going for value because you have that one opponent to really consider yourself with, think about their range, uh, well, put them on a pre-flop range, decide how that range interacts with the board, then you can adjust your bet sizing to get that maximum value. That's why it's so crucial to play with a bread and butter mindset. The more of those situations you put yourself in, the more likely you'll come out ahead in your play uh, sessions. The second aspect to getting more bread and butter out of your play sessions is to create ranges for open raising and for three betting. Creating ranges off the felt, it allows you to free your mind for important in-game factors to consider. So for your ranges, you basically want to create them so that you open raise and you isolate more from the cutoff and the button. So your ranges in those two positions should be at their widest. 
from the middle positions and earlier, uh, basically if you're on a six max, that means under the gun and MP. If you're at a full ring table, it's those five positions before the cutoff, you know, under the gun all the way through MP2. In all of those positions, you wanna stay nice and tight. Now, if your table is allowing you to get away with murder, to raise a lot more, to three bit a lot more, they're not pushing back, then you can on the fly make some adjustments to your tight early position and middle position ranges and you can put yourself in more bread and butter opportunities if they're allowing you to raise more and get away with it more. So when it comes to your open raising ranges, I recommend somewhere in the early positions and middle positions, use one range and keep it roughly 12 to 14%. Don't let it get too clouded with junky hands. You want to be more value oriented in those earlier positions. So your range, when we think about it as a percentage form, you know, keep it between 12 to 14%. So that means somewhere around 170 combos total. And in the show notes, I have a screenshot right there of a 12.2% 162 combo range. Uh, you can see the show notes, but I'll tell you what it is right now. It's every single pocket pair, ace-10 suited or greater, ace-queen offsuit or greater, uh, also has suited connector 7-6 suited or greater, all the way through king-queen suited, of course. And then there's some three-bet bluffing hands in there of ace-5 suited, through ace deuce suited. That's the kind of hand or the kind of range I recommend uh, from those early through middle positions. And what this does, when you constrict it this tight, you can even drop off those tiniest pairs, deuces through fives if you want. When you constrict your range this much, you take away your opponent's opportunities to do a lot of in position calling and in position three betting against you, which uh, that tends to take you out of bread and butter situations when you face a lot of three bets and maybe do some calls or folds, no longer bread and butter. When you face a lot of callers in position against you, you know, you open under the gun and you get four callers, MP, MP2, cutoff and button. Jeez, that's not bread and butter at all. So staying tight in the early positions allows you to see more bread and butter opportunities. And then when we think about the cutoff and the button, I highly recommend a roughly 20% range in the cutoff and a 30% range on the button. Now, for some of you, that might sound pretty small. And if you go to the show notes page, you can see some ranges that I recommend right here. But here's the thing. You can always make on the fly adjustments like I had said earlier. If your table is letting you get away with murder and every single one of your cutoff open raises, uh, you know, the button, the small blind fold and the big blind is calling, so, you know, you're basically getting to bread and butter every single time you open. Go ahead and start opening wider. If the same thing happens on the button, if the blinds are folding a lot, raise a lot more. If one or both blinds are calling and not three betting, raise a lot more on the button as well. You know, if you follow these stricter ranges, you're going to keep yourself nice and tight. You're staying under control and you can always adjust on the felt. I, by giving you these ranges, I'm not telling you this is all you can open. You know, for example, the cutoff range, king 10 suited is the worst queen. I'm sorry, worst queen is the worst king in the range. But if you choose to open with king 9 suited, king 8 suited, king do suited, if your opponents are letting you, go ahead and do it. There's nothing stopping you. I'm not going to stop you. And I'm telling you, not telling you uh, to not do it. If it's going to give you bread and butter situation, then go ahead and make the play. And here's the thing, I told you earlier that when you create rages off the felt, it allows you or it frees up your mind for more important in-game considerations, right? So whatever hand you're dealt, whether it's in your range, whether it isn't, if you feel like it's a good raise right here, before you click raise, consider how the remaining opponents will respond. You want to look at their stats, like their two bet call percentage and their pre-flop three bet. You want to look at it by position. Uh, this can tell you so much more than just the total stat percentage. So look at those to get a good idea of what to expect pre-flop after you make the raise and what to potentially expect post-flop after, after they decide to call you. So you want to take a look also at their fold to see bet, their fold to bet on the flop and the turn to get an idea and to begin visualizing how you might approach the hand if you get to the flop. Before we move on to the third aspect, when it comes to three betting in the cutoff, I recommend somewhere around a 3% range and on the button, a 6% range. Now, like I said, this is just a simple range. You know that these are good ranges to three bet with. If your opponents are letting you get away with more, go ahead and do it. You know, if the MP player just keeps opening and folding to three bets, then yeah, go ahead. Three bet them with King 10 suited. Three bet them with 8 7 suited. Three bet them with uh, whatever. Jack 8 suited if you want. If it's going to work and if it's going to give you the results, you can stray outside of these ranges. 
but I recommend staying tight in the ranges that you create so that when you're in game, you know that these hands are good, that they're good to three bet with either as bluffs or as value. Now you can concern yourself with the other factors, like I said, the opponent you're facing, the bet sizing you're facing, the opponent yet to act, um, the overall table conditions, the situations, all that kind of stuff. So now on to the third aspect of getting in bread and butter situations. It's in-game play, and it's basically making adjustments when you're in-game. So every table that you're at, uh, you know, live, you're playing one table. Online, you might be playing three, ten tables, whatever. Assess your table and label it as a bread and butter table, or possibly not. A bread and butter table is one that lets you put yourself in lots of bread and butter spots. So it gets folded to you a lot, so you get to make a ton of open raises. When you open raise, you're not getting three bet a lot. And uh, when somebody open raises ahead of you and you three bet, they're not doing a lot of four bets unless they have aces or kings. You know, that kind of situation, that's a bread and butter table. That's one that you want to stay at and milk that table for as much profit as you can. And another part of in-game play, like I had mentioned, is adjusting your ranges on the fly based on the table and the conditions. So I said stay tight in EP through MP, right? Well, if the cutoff and button, if they're folding a heck of a lot, go ahead and raise more on the hijack. Use a 20%, 25 a 30% range. As long as they are not fighting back against you, go ahead and start upping your ranges, you know, your 2-betting and your 3-betting, in order to put yourself in more bread and butter spots. Now, speaking of the hands in your ranges, if the hand is in your range, before you click that raise, whether it's 2-bet or 3-bet, first consider if it's a good situation to put yourself in. Just because it's in your range doesn't mean it's worth playing. You want to consider all those things I mentioned earlier. You know, you want to consider your opponents, your your potential future opponents, what post-flop play might look like, the bet sizing you're facing and the bet sizing you're going to do. There's lots of stuff to wrap your mind around um, when you're doing a lot of 2-betting and 3-betting pre-flop. Another thing, when you're on the tables, you want to actively search for situations where you can open raise and where you can 3-bet more frequently with hands possibly outside of your ranges. You want to look for players to your right who have tight ranges and fold a lot pre-flop. Um, or it's also good when they open raise wide but fold to your 3-bet in position a lot. So if you look to the three players to your right, if one of them opens and folds a lot, then pay attention every time he opens Consider the value or consider the positive or negative EV nature of 3-betting, regardless of what you're holding. He might be opening and then folding so much that every 3-bet will be profitable and all the other players at the table won't or will allow you to get away with it. They won't fight back against your 3-bet bluffing. And here's one thing that's pretty important. You cannot control your opponent's actions. So you can't necessarily say, I'm going to be bread and butter this hand no matter what. You know, if you three bet, you could always get four bet. If you three bet, everybody can fold and you don't even get to see the flop, right? Well, you can work to influence their decisions with the bet sizing that you choose. If the button loves to three bet versus cut off open raises and you're in the cutoff, then you might want to open for bigger sizes like 3.5 or even four big blinds if you don't want to face their three bet. And if you're in the hijack and the cutoff and button, maybe they both call way too frequently, then open raise, um, or even if you're making an isolation raise, isolate at a bigger sizing, four, five, six big blinds, whatever you have to do to get the results that you want. And one position or situation in particular is the blind versus blind opportunities when you're in the big blind. So you're going to have post lot position no matter what. You can 3-bet more often when uh, the small blind is the only player. If they come in for the 2-bet, you can 3-bet with a wider range. As you know, a lot of small blind players, they have very wide, like 30, 40, 50, even greater percentage of open raises in the small blind. Take advantage of this. Fight back against them. If they choose to, or if they're going to open raise and then call a heck of a lot, Make your three bets kind of on the stronger side. You know, ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, king-queen, good pocket pairs and stuff. If they fold a lot, then do a lot more bluffing against them. You know, turn that king-10 suited instead of calling in the big blind, turn it into a three-bet bluffing hand. If they fold 60% of the time, you're just making an extra three big blinds right there off of their open raise. And before you turn a calling hand into a three-betting hand, ask yourself this critical question. How will the player respond? If they can call with worse, then it's absolutely fine to turn your ace-jack suited, king-10 suited, pocket nines. It's totally fine to turn those into a value-3 betting hand. And simultaneously, 
Sure, now you're three bidding for value, but you're also putting yourself in a bread and butter situation. Instead of calling with that hand, now you're the three better. You have the initiative. You can make the C bet um, potentially for bluff or for value and get what you want on the flop. And if you three bet and they just end up folding, great. If you were bluffing with your three bet, then you just earned 4.5 big blinds, you know, depending on the situation. You just earn that quick 4.5 big blinds without even needing to see the flop. And if you are value betting with your three bet and they ended up folding, eh, oh well. At least you earned their chips easily instead of allowing them to see bet and take down the pot in case you missed the flop. Now, I've talked about sticky notes before. What a sticky note is, is taking like, you know, a post-it note and writing a very uh, critical piece of information on it to help remind yourself to do this in game. So here's a little sticky note for getting more bread and butter. All you're gonna write is get more bread and butter in position on flop with opportunity to see bet and against one or two players. That is your sticky note for your sessions this week. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And they have both of my books, How to Study Poker Volumes 1 and 2. And pretty soon they're going to have Preflop Online Poker, my third book in audiobook form. So on top of those, they have tons of other various poker content from uh, spotting live poker tells, tournament play, cash game play, all that stuff. There are so many audiobooks for you to check out. Just go to audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. And one quick shout out today, Laura Clark purchased my Mathematics of Poker webinar. This is actually a webinar that I did with Mark Warner um, a, a few months ago, and it was really good stuff. It is full of so much good information. I'm sure Laura is going to have, um, uh, <laughs> she has a lot of studying to do going through that webinar and then taking everything that she learns in that webinar, then going through her database um, looking at various hands and whether she made profitable, unprofitable calls, positive EV plays, um, outs and odds, just anything mathematics wise we cover in that poker mathematics webinar. So thank you very much, Laura, for your support. And if you would like to purchase this webinar for yourself, just go to the show notes page to check out the details. Back to class, poker people. All right, so we talked about getting into more bread and butter situations. Now let's talk about avoiding those non-bread and butter spots. So it's actually pretty simple to do so. Just call less often. But what can happen to some of us is we look down at a hand like Jack-9 suited and Queen-10 suited and Ace-8 offsuit, and we just kind of imagine the possibilities. Wow, my Ace-8, I can flop two pair and I can get tons of value from an Ace-King or an Ace-Queen. Or the Queen-10 suited, you think to yourself, wow, I can flop a straight or I can flop a flush and I could take his entire stack. Well, we need to not allow ourselves to get suckered into making what seems like a positive EV call doing that with hands that are hard to play and in situations that will be hard to extract value out of. Some of you listening, and I know this is true of some of you, you treat calling like a default play. My hand is suited, I call. It's connected, I call. I've got a random ace X hand, I call. Pocket aces, I three bet. You know, you kind of play by default and calling must never be a default play. You're giving your opponent initiative on the next street when you call. And we all know how much easier it is to take down a pot when you bet with initiative. That's why we're talking about bread and butter situations. So don't give other players the bread and butter advantage without good cause. Now, there are two aspects here to avoiding those non-bread and butter spots. The first aspect is to create calling ranges that limit your calling opportunities. You know that calling is not as profitable as when it comes to, you know, two betting or three betting pre-flop. So you want to limit how often you do this. Your calling ranges can be a little bit bigger when you're going to have post-flop position. So basically in the cutoff and the button, and if you're in the big blind versus a small blind. But if you're expecting to be out of position, keep them very, very tight. For example, in the show notes, you can see a screenshot of a very small 4.4% or 58 combo early position calling range versus an early position raise. Now, this range is made up of jacks through sevens, ace-queen, ace-jack suited, king-queen suited, and queen-jack suited. 
Now, this range is nice and tight for a very simple reason. As soon as you call on the EP, you easily allow or you can cause a cascade of calls behind you because your, Paul, your call just sweetened the pot with an additional three big blinds. The next person that calls, they need a little bit less equity. The next person, a little bit less equity. So this is the kind of range that I recommend an EP versus an EP. Now with this range, this is telling you that you can three bet with queens or greater and ace king. If you decide that this is your early position calling range, that's just fine. You're keeping your calls nice and tight. But on the fly, you could decide, well, you know, the early position raiser, he's actually pretty aggressive and he treats the early position like a steal because his raise for sin is 30%. Well, if that opponent really is that way, raising first in and 30%, you can easily turn some of those hands into three betting hands. You get three bet with jacks and tens when the early position raiser is open raising at 30%. You get three bet with ace queen. You get three bet with ace jack suited even if you want. You just need to determine how they're going to respond to your three bets and how the rest of the table will respond to any potential calls that you're making. So keep your ranges nice and tight. I have another screenshot for the button uh, calling range versus a cutoff. Now this one's quite a bit bigger and the reason why is you're calling on the button versus a wide range with only two players yet to act. You only have the small blind and big blind and because you're on the button no matter what you're in position post flop uh, assuming you don't fold to a three bet pre flop of course. Now this range is a 9.4% 124 combo range and it's made of nines through deuces, uh, ace jack, king queen, Ace 10 suited, Ace 9 suited, King Jack suited, King 10 suited, Queen Jack suited, Queen 10 suited, and Jack 10 suited, Jack 9 suited, 10 9 suited, 10 8 suited, and 9 8 suited. So with this range right here, you're giving yourself plenty of opportunity uh, with a lot of suited hands, a lot of suited connectors, suited gappers, as well as suited Broadway stuff, and every pocket pair you're calling with 9s and below. You only have two offsuit hands, the Ace Jack offsuit and the King Queen offsuit. Now, one of the good things about this range is it hits flops very well. You're suited, so you've got plenty of flush draw and straight draw potential built in. And with this range, you're automatically three betting with tens or greater and ace queen or greater. But depending on the cutoff player, there's nothing to stop you from three betting your ace jack, your king queen, your king jack, even your nines and eights. If the player is ripe for three betting, meaning they're going to call with a lot worse hands than you or they're folding better hands, then up that three bet percentage, but do it on the fly at the table. Assess the situation first before you uh, call wider or three bet wider. Alrighty, so the second aspect to uh, avoiding those non bread and butter spots is to utilize the calling ranges in game. You created them for a purpose. Don't ignore them now, use them in the game. If a hand falls outside of the calling ranges that you set, your first instinct is to fold it. But if your hand falls within the range, before you click call, ask yourself this incredibly important question. Why am I calling here? If you are thinking about getting involved in a non-bread and butter spot, you must have a great reason for doing so. Here are three potential great reasons. Number one, my hand is ahead of villain's range. For example, that could be like ace queen when villain has every ace in their range. Totally fine to call with right there. That doesn't mean three betting is bad, but calling is potentially fine. Another great reason, I'm disguising my incredibly strong hand against an aggressive post-flop player. Maybe you're calling with aces or kings. Another great reason, if I 3-bet this value hand, the opponent is folding all worse hands and only calling with better. So sometimes that can happen when you're considering a 3-bet with pocket jacks, but your opponent's only going to continue with queens or greater. Don't 3-bet, just call right there. And now here are some bad reasons, and, and I'm guilty of this, as I'm sure all of you are. There's three bad reasons. I've done them all, and multiple times too, of course. Uh, the first one, I don't want to fold. It's as simple as that. I don't want to fold whatever hand it is, so I end up calling. Uh, the next bad reason, I can hit a miracle hand. It's like holding jack-8 suited, 9-6 suited, 8-7 suited. You know how sometimes I talk about those uh, pretty hands that you look at it, oh, you see all the potential, all the beauty in it, but you don't see all the uh, the most likely uh, result of playing that hand is that you're going to be losing those pre-flop chips along with some additional post-flop chips. And the final bad reason uh, to make a call, it's only one big blind. So what if I'm out of position against four other players? 
An, an example of this is in the big blind with jack four offsuit, you know, against a min open and three other callers already. So that's what you want to ask yourself and you want to have a great reason. Why am I calling here? And if you have a great reason, make the call. And what you also want to do is you want to visualize post flop play before you click call. So think about what boards will help you um, in you know, your calling range and what is going to hinder your opponent and their raising range. And how will they likely play on the flop? So you want to look at their stats like C-bet, um, whether it's in position or out of position, or just their general bet and aggression factor stats for post-flop play. You also want to look at any kind of history, like what do you know about them? Do you know that they get really aggressive with their flush draws? Are they uh, fit or fold on the flop? Do they Are they one and done? Do they, ev do they bet every single flop, but only bet on the turn when they hit something good? Also think about what position you're going to be in post-flop should you make that call. Are you going to be out of position or in position versus the Razor or other potential players? Challenge! Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Create open raising and 3-bet ranges that are tight in the early position and middle positions, but increase a lot in the cutoff and the button. You can also increase your big blind ranges as well when the only player you're facing is the small blind. Play your sessions this week with a bread and butter mindset, so try to put yourself into as many bread and butter situations as you can. And try to avoid those non-bread and butter situations by constricting your calling ranges and maybe turn some calling hands into 3-bidding hands. Oh yeah, and don't forget that sticky note that I told you. Put this on your computer monitor on a post-it note. Get more bread and butter in position on flop with the opportunity to c-bet and against one or two players. Now it's your turn to take action and do something positive for your poker game. Oh, that's it now. Get out there and be somebody. Go write a book. This episode isn't complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 187. Go there for screenshots and links to everything I discussed today uh, to discover ways that you can support the show and also to sign up for the Weekly Boost newsletter so you can get notified as soon as my book, my new book, Preflop Online Poker, goes on sale with a special offer for free audiobook with purchase. Thank you so much for listening today. I am putting out more episodes now. So make sure you enable my Alexa flash briefing skill. And please subscribe to the show in iTunes or your favorite podcatching app. If you can type the words Smart Poker Study, you can find me on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you have any questions, I am doing a Q&A next week. So please send them to me, sky at smartpokerstudy.com. Alrighty, poker people. So like I said, next week, episode 188, is going to be three question Q&A or I might give another audiobook excerpt. I'm not sure which yet. Just be on the lookout for that next week. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.